already had some interesting stuff on there, but I doubt that must not have been the Lord's will. But maybe I can remember what he said. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Maybe I can speak tonight, preach. I love the air conditioner. How many likes the air conditioner? This time of the year, I mean, I just absolutely adore it. And uh, he got hot back in April. Come on, somebody. And it ain't cooled off since then, except from the air conditioner. And so, my words are going to be honest. I got mad at my wife the other night, went to the couch and slept. I'm going to get preached on tonight, too, in my Bible study. Someone's going to get me out of the way. And, and I slept on the air conditioner vent on the couch here, blowing right down on top of my head. And I woke up the next morning and my throat was sore. My wife said, if you'd have come to bed, your throat wouldn't be sore. So I've been battling that all week. I don't really have no cold, I don't guess. I ain't running no fever or nothing like that. But I got this old nagging cough, so I don't know how much I can shower down on it tonight. But we're going to do what we can to serve the Lord. That's what we're here for. I want to thank Mr. Jeff and for you too. Uh, I want to go ahead and make an announcement early. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I think it was October the 20-something. It'll be a Sunday evening. Y'all can be thinking about that for the next week or so, which I think we got a, probably two months just about, I think, for October or something. But... Uh, I'm supposed to preach a one-night revival. It's supposed to be a three-night revival, I think, three or four nights. He's going to have different speakers, but it's at the Methodist Church. I never preached there before on uh, 84. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. But right before you, uh, right before you get to the uh, yeah. yeah, before you get to the funeral home. Vern Cleaner used to pastor that, and I don't even know who that is, but I remember seeing that sign there a hundred times. It seemed like right by. But nevertheless, it's going to be on Sunday evening, and they have asked me what time, and I told them I'd get back with them and let them know what he's supposed to get back to me today and let me know. Do you have a day? It's 20 something. Is that on Sunday? It's 20. It's 29th, is that? Uh-oh, I'm not going to talk to him then. I'll check with him and see. I think he's got a couple more folks scheduled up. But anyhow, I told him, I said, well, they might just pack up and come with me, or they may have service here. So y'all be thinking about what you want to do. If you want to have service here, you let me know. If you want to come to the Methodist Church, and let's shout hallelujah there, and we'll load up and go over there. In Matthew chapter, it come from YouTube. I want to thank Mr. Jeff for that. He's seen me off on YouTube, and, and, and I know that I knew the guy that asked me to preach, which he's not the pastor, so. But anyhow, it came from YouTube. So we'd like to say thank you, Jeff, for what you do on YouTube. It ain't the only thing. There's been a lot of people comment upon seeing the, the messages and the singing off of YouTube. It's been, been a blessing for those that are shut in and, and some of those that are nosy. <laughs> that don't want to come but just want to check out what, what happened. Let me see what happened. Uh-oh, I'm on YouTube now. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18, 21. I always get myself in trouble. The parable of the unforgiving servant. There's that husband on that couch, ain't he? Unforgiving servant. I'm just going to go on and say for we pray and read the scriptures, I don't have no problem if I open the door up for someone in the church and they walk by and step on my toe. If they say, oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I don't have no problem with that whatsoever. Maybe you don't need it. But if the same person walks by seven times in a row and steps on my toe, I'm mad by then. Do I got anybody else out there like that? Yeah. It was easy to forgive them the first time. But after the seventh time, I know you're doing it on purpose. And it ain't, it ain't really sorry no more. So 
Let's get into the word tonight, Father. We thank you for your word. God, we pray for wisdom and knowledge, power, God, and the abundance of my heart. My mouth will speak. My heart may be filled with love. Lord, and you bless your people tonight in your word. We'll give you praise. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft, often, that's a short word for often, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter goes ahead and gives him an answer. <laughs> Till seven times, Peter saying seven times, Lord, and I'm gonna blow my top. Now some of you sit there and cackle over this, but some of us is just as guilty as Peter, if not worse. Some of us can't even make it to seven times. Now that word seven, and you know just as good as well as I do, seven has a spiritual meaning through Scripture, and it means completion or perfect. The word seven, seven days. Oh, God made the heavens and the earth and everything that was in it. So that word sometimes has a spiritual meaning. Now we're going to, as I begin to search these scriptures and pray over these things and study over these things, I want us to really find out what the parable is all about tonight. Jesus gives us a picture tonight about the unforgiving servant. So let's go ahead and get into it and find out what he's talking about. He says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had began to reckon, that word means to calculate. He's doing him some calculation and coming up with how many people owes him. One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. My goodness, sell in the house. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid his hands on him. He, he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Does that remind you of anybody in this church? Y'all ain't shouting amen. Everybody's quiet. Don't want to tell on ourselves, do we? And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. The sweet parable of the unforgiving servants. I wonder how many churches are drying and dying because the brothers and sisters don't love one another. They got secret love, secret admirers, secret faults, secret failures, secret unforgiveness. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews to beware lest a... a it calls it, it calls it springing up whereby many shall be defiled, a root of bitterness. That's what the book of Hebrews said. Uh, beware, take heed, lest a root of bitterness springing up whereby many shall be defiled. Now, I want to get into it tonight by the talents because Jesus put the talents in there for a parable. He also put the pence in there. So let's go back to verse number 24. And this is where I left my information on my phone, but I'm going to tell it the very best I can remember. If we do not understand, let me back myself up. How many of those are hermeneutics mean? Hermeneutics. Anybody know what that word means? Huh? That word means to, that, that's, a, that's a class to interpret scripture. And I often said when I went to school to be ordained that they didn't teach me nothing about the Bible. But the Lord showed me different this morning when I was praying. And he says, yeah, he says, do you 
Remember whenever school first started and your son is sitting on the couch and he's asking mama to come in and say, mama, help me with my homework. Do y'all ever have any kids like that that comes and, and, and ask this question like that or had kids to come and ask questions like that? And, and, and when you begin to ask them what the problem is, they begin to look over and you say, well, just read it. It's in there. But the kids don't really want to hear that, do they? You know what they really want? The answer. They wanted you to give them the answer. And that's the way I was in, in class. I wanted the preachers to get up there and tell me what I didn't understand about the Bible. And that's what hermeneutics is all about. It teaches you. It's a class to teach you to interpret Scripture. And this is a wonderful lesson right here to learn in hermeneutics. You go home and I can say I learned something about hermeneutics. What's that word? I don't know how to spell it. I don't know what it means, but I learned me a lesson in hermeneutics. And what it actually does is if you don't know the people that they're talking to, you're not going to get it. If you don't sit where they sit at and understand what they're going through, let me, let me, let me just get down to our level tonight. If you go to these new teenage modern people and don't know what TTYL or LOL or TMI or all that kind of stuff is when they send you a text, you're going to be lost. Some of you lost right now. Look at me like, what does all that mean? You don't know what it means because you ain't sat with them long enough. If you sit with this new generation, they'll teach you all kinds of stuff. All stuff you don't want to learn. And it's the same way with, with, with what's going on tonight about talents. Now, when's the last time you went to the store and put out some talents? Lord, I thought talents mean when you get up there and sing. That was a talent that you had. But Jesus is not talking about your singing ability. He's talking about money here. Talents. How many, how many knows what a talent is? How much money? Because if we don't get that tonight, we're not going to understand this parable. How, anybody got a guess of how much ta one talent is? What's it equivalent to in the U.S. currency? Phones out. Y'all gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> Six thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. So Jesus is saying ten thousand. How many's got a calculator real quick? Like, push in ten thousand times six thousand. Sixty million, right? Or am I wrong about that? $60 million. Did we get that? Am I right about it? All right. How much? $60 million. We just read over that every time we read our Bible. 10,000 talents. What is 10,000 talents? Jesus has given us a picture tonight that tells us that the first man that had the debt when he came to him, he owed him 10,000 talents. 60 million dollars. Now that, that's pretty steep, right? Most of us are never going to make that in our lifetime. But as this scholar that I began to study on this even showed me a little bit further, it really got interesting. That if you step down to their time of living, 60 million dollars will show enough a lot of money. Because 100 pence, go to that scripture. Oh, I don't forget what scripture it was, but the second one had a hundred pence. Now, this is equal to a hundred cents, or oh, denario, whatever you want to call it. I'm trying to trying to get it into equivalent to U.S. currency so we can understand it. So, in other words, it come up to a third of a year's salary. Now, I'm talking about forgiveness tonight, and I don't want to lose y'all because I'm not much of a teacher, and I've already done lost some of y'all. Some of y'all are like, I don't know what he's talking about now. He's rambling on. But if we don't understand it, then there's no need to have a Bible study. We might as well have a Bible preaching. How many wants to learn the Word of God and know a little bit about what we shout about? <laughs> Jesus calls the first... Let me go back through these scriptures. The Holy Spirit's giving me these, these things that I'm remembering. I want you to go back to... Verse number 25, watch this. But for as much as he had not to pay his Lord, somebody say Lord. Lord. Is that uppercase or lowercase? Lowercase. 
So he's talking about the king, right? Jesus is giving a parable about the king that the servant owed money to. Verse number 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. Is that overcase or lowercase? Uh-oh. Jesus is stepping into the position of the lowercase Lord. And now all of a sudden, he's praying to the Lord to have patience with me. Tonight, Jesus is... How many has ever had something that's hard to forgive? Somebody's hurt you. Somebody's done some things that, man, is hard to forgive. Am I talking to anybody tonight that's ever really had some things that... It's just hard to overlook. It's just hard. No matter how hard you prayed, no matter how hard you said you forgave, but inside it's hard to forgive. Jesus is showing Peter tonight because Peter's headed up to here. He's saying, Lord, seven times and I'm just going to flip my wig. I'm tired of this person running over me. I'm tired of this people talking ugly to me and using me. And, and, and it ain't nothing worse being used, is it? People think when you get saved, you're a doormat, don't they? They just walk all over you and talk to you any kind of way and treat you. Well, if he's Christ, he's, he's supposed to be saved. Now, how many ever heard that before? Whenever you're out there in the public and, and they see you not living like Jesus living, they say, oh, they thought they were saved. On, Hello, we're Christ-like. We're not Christ. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Somebody should have got that one. You see, the devil tries to make you feel like every day you got to be Christ. There wasn't but one Christ, honey. He's gone. He's in our hearts, and we got to be like him, but there will never be another Christ. There will never be another one that knew no God, that was tempted just like we were. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Yet he knew no sin, praise God, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace tonight, not for what we done, but for what he done. Give God praise tonight for what Jesus done. But we cannot overlook that just because we're not Christ, we cannot overlook not being Christ-like. Jesus is so strict about this message tonight. He says, if you don't forgive, then you won't be forgiven. I'm going to tell you something. We all need forgiveness. Amen. Every one of us. Yes. 10,000 talents. I forgot how many years. Lord, I wish I'd have brought my little, my little notes in with me. But 10,000 talents was like 600 years worth of 350 or 600 years worth of normal people's income. 100 pence was like a third of a year's salary. Now what that speaks to me is I don't know how y'all feel, but I couldn't do without a third of my salary. If I do without a third of my salary, they're going to come get some stuff. Now, I'm, not, I'm not scheduled that tight, but a third is almost a half. And that's like going a half year with no money coming in. Come on. That'd be real tough. Third, a third of the year, you don't receive no check, but you got all them bills to pay for. But it ain't impossible. So Jesus is not overlooking our feelings. He's not being, being a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He's saying, I know that whoever hurts you, I know how you feel. He said, but I want to show you how it felt to be me on Calvary to have everybody sin on me. 10,000 talents is a lifetime. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying tonight that we owe Jesus our whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Every bit of our life belongs to him. Yeah. So the next time that you come to the place in your life, somebody hurts you. How many of those people don't even go to church nowadays for church folk hurt them? All I can tell you, that's an excuse. Because no matter where you go, there always going to be somebody to hurt you. Jesus even says it in the gospel. He says it's impossible that offenses won't come. He said they're coming. Impossible. And Jesus tells you that we're human and we're going to hurt one another. You better get ready. They're coming. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings. Yeah. He said, but woe be unto them who the offenses come by. In other words, we're not trouble starters. We're peacemakers. That's what the scripture says. 
We've been called to be peacemakers. But when you don't forgive someone, it causes Jesus' heart to hurt because of the stuff that he has forgiven us of. Amen? Amen. Verse 25 says, For as much as he had not to pay his Lord, lowercase, commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. Jesus is telling us tonight that our salvation, our forgiveness, cost him everything. It cost him his life. It cost him his freedom for a while while he was on earth. It cost him everything. So the next time it seemed like it's hard to forgive someone, we need to begin to think about what Jesus done for us, and it ought to never get hard. Every time we think about it. And this, this is going to this is going to catch in one day. The devil's telling me, quit preaching this. It's not making no sense. Oh, but it made so much this morning as I was studying over it. Because we get in our little temper tantrums as, as church folk. You know, church folk got temper tantrums. You know that, don't you? We pout. We sull up. We get mad at one another. We don't talk to one another for weeks. I woke up the next morning. And it was, I don't even remember what me and my wife was arguing about. Bless the Lord, I showed her. Step on the count. The next morning, I just, and it was something other, I don't know. She's got weaknesses. I got weaknesses. We all got weaknesses. I heard somebody say the other day on fellowship hall, I'm so thankful that God blessed us with a pastor that's human. <laughs> See, I'm just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just bold enough to tell you about it. I'm not going to hide behind the sacred desk and act like I don't have flaws. God people call people that have flaws that I could come down to your level and tell you about a man that we going to that ain't got me. Amen? I don't lower myself to the devil's standard of living and go out there and live unholy on purpose. Now, now this is where it ties into the book of Hebrews where it says, He that sinneth willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice. Makes you angry when somebody hurts you on purpose, don't it? You ready to fight, though you do stuff and everything else. God said, look, it hurts me when you sin purposely and willfully. It didn't say there remain no more forgiveness. It said there may no more sacrifice. Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice. Amen? Jesus don't only want us to, to, to forgive. He wants us to repent of what we're asking forgiveness for. You know what we struggle with the most? Is forgiving ourselves. Right. Come on, bro. Man, I keep going back to the same old mistake every time, every time. Have you ever thought about you may have a weakness? In that very area? And God wants it to heal. But you won't get back up and, and you know, when children begin to ride bicycles, it takes them a little while to learn, don't they? They have weaknesses. Why? They never rode a bicycle before. Everything we do in life is our first time. I'm a first time parent. I ain't never been a parent no more. I'm doing my best. And then you got old people. Come on, somebody that come by that's had 40 youngins and want to tell you how to raise yours. Well, if I was my children, that's what I would have But it ain't yours. <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me preach tonight. And we're, we're not to be arrogant. We're to take counsel from older people because sometimes they'll teach you a little something if you ain't hard-headed enough to listen. Stop and listen sometimes. But a child, as he falls down, it makes him stronger. You never thought that a fall would make you stronger, would you? I tell you what it's doing is making you tougher. See, you was scared. That's why you had to have daddy to hold on to the bike. When I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, God gave me a vision of a bicycle, of a child riding a bicycle. That's all I seen as he was filling me with the Holy Ghost. One morning in my house, he gave me a vision of a child with training wheels and a bicycle. Today, I still don't know why, that, why he gave me that. But every time that we fall, we want to give up, don't we? It's frustrating trying to learn new things. Everything we're doing is new. We're a pilgrim looking for a country whose builder and maker is the Lord. Somebody give me praise tonight. The first time when daddy's holding the bicycle, you're scared to death of the fall. You're scared it's going to kill you or hurt you. Oh, but after you fall off one time and see that it wasn't as bad as it looked, 
Second time you get on there, you might fall again, but you're not concentrating on the fall. You're worrying about balancing yourself. Sometimes we can't even concentrate to learn how to drive because we're too busy worrying about the fall. God said, if you'll get your eyes off the fall, I'll teach you how to ride. Boy, I'm speaking to somebody tonight. I feel my hair speaking up. I said, if we quit worrying about the fall and start worrying about how to ride, God, take away the fall. Can't go forward looking down, worrying about if I fall, I got something for you to fall. You ready? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us, your Sunday school teachers, your preachers, your deacons, your trustee, they've all fallen short. Every one of them fell. Some of them still falling. Some of us still falling. Amen. Amen. But one thing I learned about when I got on my knees, I fell on my knees. Come on, somebody. I fell on my knees and I got back up. And every time I fall, I still get back up. And by the grace of God, I'm still getting up today. Somebody say, get up. Get up. Dust yourself off and get up. I got to go to my scripture. Y'all ready? Psalm 103, verse 12. I love the scripture. Psalm 103, verse 12. When you get back up, you must do this. Because if not, you're going to be like Peter. You're going to keep asking, when's the seventh time coming? As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Some of us have no idea what the east is from the west. It's a circle that never ends. Everybody's looking for it Monday, wasn't it? Where the moon at? I ain't seen no moon yet. My little boy said, Daddy, I had any goggles. I already not had no goggles. I ain't seen no moon. I ain't seen no stars. Like everybody was talking about it's gonna get dark. As far as the east is from the west, imagine this now. If if you hurt me today or if I hurt you today, no matter how much power you have. If I hurt you six months from now, you remember that. First time I heard you. He ain't changed. He said he was sorry, but he ain't really sorry. He was sorry he wasn't. What you talking about? That's over with. Now, I don't know if that scripture means exactly that, but I'm going to say the reason why I say that. I don't know if it means exactly that. Because God has two attributes about him that would be contradicting right there. One of his attributes is omnipotent, which means all-powerful. I mean, those God's able to do anything he wants to do. Amen. Now, that, that, would, that would go along with the scripture where it says he will put your sins as far as the east is from the west because there's nothing possible with God. But there's another attribute which contradicted that, and it's omniscience. He's all-knowing. But God's got enough power that when he puts something to the side, that doesn't mean he don't have no intellect to know it's there. He just don't hold us accountable for it no more because what the blood of Jesus cleansed, what God has cleansed, that shall thou not call uncommon. Aren't you so glad tonight that Jesus can call those things which are not as though they were? He can change us if we allow him to change us. As you get up from your fall and you're going to fall, remember this. If Jesus can put it from the west to the east, east from the west, then I'm going to have to learn to put it from the west to the east. Because if you don't put it that far, you're going to drag yourself down remembering the fairies. How many right now can remember a time in their life, maybe not too long ago, maybe it was long ago, that you broke the heart of God and you knew you broke the heart of God. The Holy Spirit lets you know you broke the heart of God. Amen. 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 How many can remember a time like that and it grieved you because it grieved Him? Amen. How many knows if, if you grieve Him and if you're close enough to God, He'll grieve you? Right. How many is thankful for the grieving of the Holy Spirit that He'll let you know when you have done something you shouldn't have done? I tell you what, you better not never get to the place where it doesn't grieve you to grieve you. You can't get there. 
He tells us that they'll have teachers having itching ears and they'll have a conscience seared with a hot iron. They'll believe a lie and be damned. So many people that come to church wonder, well, if I backslidden too, backslidden too far, or if I have had too many chances, or if I blaspheme the Holy Ghost, uh, never forgiveness. But I, I, I believe myself that if you've done all that, you won't have no desire to get closer to God. Why? Because you believe a lie, be damned. Your conscience is sealed with a hot iron. I've had people literally come to recovery programs and tell me I don't feel nothing. When you do something bad and sin doesn't convict your conscience, that's the time to worry. That's the time to worry. But as long as sin is convicting your conscience, that does not give you leeway to go out there and sin. Jesus did not tell the lady who had been caught in the very act of adultery, go and sin a few more times just as long as your conscience keeps convicting you. No, he said go and sin no more just because God gives us a nudge and a conscience with inside of us to let us know what we should do and what we should not do. He also tells us to obey him for obedience is better than sacrifice. And when he tells us don't do something, he's given us power not to do it. I preach a different gospel than most folks preach. I preach a gospel that you can do it. Amen? The bad news, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The good news, we can be healed of our sin by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost that lives inside of us. But if you don't think like that, you ain't going to walk like that. If you think you sin every day, if you think you just keep falling every day, and there's no way to cure that disease, you're in the old covenant. Jesus come by to do away with the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God coming to take away the sin of the world. This generation don't want to quit sinning. They love sinning. They want to sin and go to church. They want to keep sinning and raise whole, lift up holy hands. But the truth of the matter is it's not holy hands no longer. Amen? Oh, you, you can lift up hands all you want to, but if they're not pure by the blood of Jesus, they're not holy hands. You can praise the Lord if you want to, but if it's not coming from your heart and it's only coming from your lips, it's all in vain. But Jesus said, when you begin to worship me with, my, with your heart, I'll begin to inhabit your praise. How many knows God wants to visit with the church tonight? Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, every time you walk in the door, God wants us to have revival. Amen. But we can't have it because we can't forgive. Well, Sometimes we do secret forgiveness. I forgive you with your mouth, but your hearts are far from it. I often remember the times in, in, in kindergarten and preschool and stuff like that when you got in trouble biting somebody or something and the teacher pulled you out there and got you both together and said, now say you're sorry. And you had to say you're sorry, but you didn't really mean it. You want to bite them again. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. That's why you're laughing. You, you said it, but you didn't mean it. Sometimes we're like that with our church family. Because watch this. Church families can get on your nerves. I got scripture. You better go on and say amen while you can. Church folk can get on your nerve. Your own church, your own family get on your nerve. What you talking about? I don't ever get on my nerves. You live in another world. Colossians 3 and 13 says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any forbearing one another. There you go. Forbearing? Seriously? Your own brothers in Christ? I gotta forbear them. I gotta, I gotta forgive one another. Watch this. If any man have a quarrel against him, they duking it out. They done got a fist fight, a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Maybe Paul wasn't talking about a fist fight, but when I think of a quarrel, I'm thinking of a scrap. Something's going on. It's gotten a little heated argument, one or the other. He said, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You see all these things happen to churches 
And people look down at churches and say, you know what? There's no hope for that church. There's too much junk going on in church. But when the word of God is presented to the church and we begin to clean up our acts, then God revisits the church because God has used crazy churches before. Think of the Corinthians, man. They had they had one 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 woman or one dude sleeping with her with his stepfather or one woman sleeping with her stepfather or something. How many remember that? First Corinthians chapter five. But God still used the church. What am I trying to say? We're not perfect yet, but we press into the mark for the prize of the high calling. We're forgetting those things which are behind. They 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 end up the water on the bridge. We spend so much time thinking of the times that are past us when we need to focus on the here and now. Amen. The times that are past us, don't take me the wrong way, but the times that are past us, they're really not going to affect how we spend eternity. <coughs> wow. A lot of folks got saved back there, yeah. but they ain't saved today. Great. A lot of folks was lost back there. But don't mean you got to be lost today. Let me tell you the most important mile, not, not degrading the first kneel at the altars. How many remembers that day when the Lord took the burdens off of your soul and you gave your heart to Jesus and tears flooded your eyes and you began to feel the presence of the Lord as he entered into your body and born you again. What a, what a wonderful time. But that's not going to be nowhere near to the time that our outward man perish and Though we be absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord. And our spirit man joins God in heaven. And our new birth and our new home, that's going to be the last mile of the way. And that's the most important mile tonight. Amen, but you can't go if you harbor unforgiveness. Right. You can't do it. I want to show you a few scriptures, if you will. Turn with me in your Bible to Mark chapter 11, verse 25. If you will mark that, I want to read these scriptures to you for the time's sake. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. He says, and when you stand praying, I love that scripture right there because I'm not much of a needle. I love to stand praying. <laughs> and when you stand praying, forgive if you have all that remains um, anything against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. We find in our parable tonight, that when the man first came to, we might as well say the Lord, because he even put his name in verse number 26 when he prayed and said, Lord, have patience with me. The Lord forgave the servant. Am I right about it? Ain't that what he done? He forgave him. Watch this. Watch this. Back, back in Matthew, turn with me back to our parable. You can mark that and write that down. Matthew in 18, in verse number 27, says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Well, somebody ought if we got that right now, we would get happy. Amen. $60 million? If I had to go home tonight knowing I'm just going to lose my home, my truck, my job, my lights, color, I ain't going to have no light, I ain't got no house, everything, no groceries on the table. You know what kind of weight I towed around my children go to school and ask, why ain't you had a bath? We ain't got no running water. Matter of fact, I've been wearing the same clothes for three days because we don't even have no house no more. Why? $60 million? Everybody's coming to your house taking something. And now Jesus just all of a sudden coming by and just says, don't worry about it. You ain't got to pay me nothing back. Amen. <laughs> we can just comprehend it. Don't you see, we can't shout about that because we ain't seen it yet. But if we went home tonight and there was a check in your mailbox to set you free from every bill you had, you'd be calling your pastor. Come on, pastor, pastor, pastor. Let me tell you what just happened. Woo, honey. been paid in full. Amen. Think about it. Amen. Don't keep preaching till we get it. 
Richard, no truck payment, brother. Hannah rolling in the Jeep, paid with me. I didn't pay for them. <laughs> Plenty of money coming in now. Because every money that comes in my house, I ain't going to pay nobody. Forget a light deal. Already been paid for. Grocery store. <laughs> ain't going to pay a dime. Real boss, they load them up, already paid for. You kidding me? Sixty million dollars? Somebody hit the lottery tonight. They'd be all over the newspaper. Brother so and so, brother Tom. Brother Tom, Sister Teresa hit the lottery. One made five million, hundred million, one made seven hundred million. We ain't got to worry about building no grow no more. Mr. Tom and Sister Teresa are gonna build it for us because it's paid for. <laughs> are you getting this yet? Because I'm gonna keep preaching. I said your sins have been forgiven. They go. Come on. If you pray and ask the Lord to have mercy on you, Jesus said they go. I took care. Oh, but we just like that, that servant. Lord, forgive me. Go back and read what he tried to do. He said, forgive me, give me a few minutes, a few, few days, and I'll pay you back. That's what's wrong with us today. We're trying to pay the Lord back for something he already done, took care of. I'm feeling a little something here tonight. Yeah, when we buy our kids Christmas, it would be an insult if they turn around and dug in their pockets. So my mama, let me give you a little money back on them clothes you bought me from Christmas. No, I gave you that. I worked hard on my own money and bought you them clothes. All I want you to do is use them and put them on it. I'm feeling this. I don't know about y'all. $60 million? Lord have mercy. And that's old time. That's old folk time money. That was back in the old days. You know what I'm saying? They wrote donkeys back then. They walked. We ride Cadillacs and Escalade. It ain't gonna tell you how much it would be now. Probably sixty billion dollars now. But I mean, if if we got sixty million, who cares about sixty billion? I mean, you know, sixty million would benefit me just as much as sixty billion. I mean, I don't need sixty billion. I can get a church. 10 billion of it. I just keep it 60 billion, whatever. Pay your tithes off of it. Church, we've been set free tonight. Yeah. You don't owe him nothing. I'm going to keep preaching. Somebody gets free tonight. We're going home with these heavy chains. What you doing this for? I'm trying to pay the Lord back. You don't owe him nothing. He said, don't come to me in two weeks' time trying to pay me back. I've already bought you with a price. I paid for you at Calvary. I wrote the whole check for you. Your grandmother, your grandpa, your cousin, your aunt. Bring them all in. I paid everybody's debts up. I don't know about y'all, but that's my kind of man. Pay my debts up. Some folks think debts are sin. Jesus put it in a parable to get our attention. Because what he done at Calvary passes our imagination. We can't even, that's why the church ain't turned upside down. Like, we're just ready to go home, Lord. Yeah, yeah. You know, I guarantee you, if you had a person going to meet you outside tonight with $60 million, you wouldn't be ready to go home. You're ready to stay right here. I ain't leaving till I see it in my pocket. That's where you ought to be tonight. You all not leave church till you got the victory right around in your pocket. What you acting so crazy for? Crazy. I just got $60 million. I wish I could see some of y'all $60 million dance tonight. Come on. $60 million. You go home and tell, tell people Bill Gates that thought he was rich. So I went to Bible study Wednesday night. Brother Brandon told me what Jesus done. Jesus gave me more than Bill Gates ever thought about having his bank account. He gave me a new name and glory. Come on, somebody. He wiped my sins away. These old bones might hurt right now. But you just wait till I step into the glory he has prepared for us. $60 million. I think I go home and dance a little while. $60 million. I done hit the lottery. 
Jesus is lottery. Amen. I'm gonna hit the Powerball. Jesus Powerball. Somebody say cha-ching. Cha -ching. You're going home tonight with some money in your pocket, ain't you? Might not have no physical money. Keep digging down and try to find one of the dollars. But you pull out that spiritual bank account. He imputed unto us righteousness. Uh-oh. I gotta get to a closing point, but we ain't gonna like our closing point. Now all that $60 million in your pocket, what you gonna do with it? Well, I'm gonna buy me a car. If my son needs a car, I'm gonna buy him a car. You know how they when folks hit the lottery. I'm gonna build me a house. Put me a big old picket fence around me. Buy me some chicken. <laughs> and some workers to feed them, clean them. I'm gonna go into chicken business. Chicken business? What you wanna go to work for? You got 60 million dollars. Don't ever wanna see no work no more. Have an air conditioner on every wall in the house. I'm gonna build me a new library where I can read. Sixty million dollars, you get somebody to read it for you. Just sit back. Well, some more right. Someone does you bad. Is Jesus talking about are you supposed to tell them I forgive you for doing me bad? Or you tell them, please forgive me for the way I have felt about you. That's a good point to make. If you have a chance and you know you've hurt someone, they come to you, and you can you can tell them, even though you may feel like you've done the wrong or they've done the wrong. Jesus don't like argument. He don't like a dampering spirit upon a service, or not only service in church, but your service for the Lord, because if you grudge and hold grudges against one another, you grieve the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit can't work through you because of what you're not allowing to go through somebody else, even if they are the ones that are guilty. So maybe that helped you out. But if someone has wronged you and you feel as if they're still mad at you, is that what you're trying to say? That, that they wronged you and it's not your fault, maybe? Well, I've had people take steal things from me. It just, I told you one day, you know, forgiveness is my worst for it. Should I forgive them for stealing, or I, hey, should I tell them to forgive me the way I feel about you? So, you know, that pain is what we went over tonight. Because I feel bad for them now. Right. For doing that to me. That pain tonight that we went over tonight would be the hundred pence worth. Jesus says, I know your pain. I know it's got to hurt for somebody to steal from you. But he says, compared to my pain and what you've done to Jesus, or what we've all done to Jesus, it's a thimble full. So as you think about what they've done to you and you meditate upon that and boil upon that, then you think about what we've done to Jesus because we've all hurt Jesus and Jesus saying tonight, you got a third of your salary gone for a year, but all my life is gone. So yes, we should forgive them and, and put it in God's hand and pray because I, as I said tonight, it's not always easy to forgive. But if we make a step forward in forgiving and ask the Lord to help us the rest of the way I believe he'll I believe he'll help us if he sees us trying but it's if we use that for an excuse to say you know it's just too hard to forgive God don't like people just sitting around saying things are too hard amen even though they can be hard and he knows our feeling and that's the reason he put those hundred pence worth in there he could have said nothing he could have said, well, they just, you know, but he put a third of a salary, third of an income in a year's time salary in there. And, and it's, how many knows that would cost you something? Amen. That, that would cost you something to go a third of your year with, with no income. And Jesus is saying, I, I recognize that it hurts you. Some people has had people to hurt them a third of their salary. I, and we're doing a parable tonight. I'm trying to get this in picture in your mind. Some of us is, you know, it may not have been a week worth of salary. And all of these are judging on how bad they hurt us. But regardless, it's nowhere compared to $60 million. Amen? Or 
100, 350 years, you'll, you'll never repay Jesus. And Jesus says to Peter whenever he said, Lord, seven times I'm going to blow my top. Jesus said, hold on. Seven times is perfect. He said, I'm going to turn around times 70 times seven. I'm going to make it all perfect. Completion. Every time your brother sins against you, forgive him. The way I feel, I'm not going to have to answer for what nobody else does. That's right. I got to answer for what I got to That's do. right. And, and I'll tell you something other else that I wanted to throw in that last little point. Don't, don't let me forget, y'all, about what you're going to do with your money. Because I'm, I'm coming back to that. I'll forget it if you don't watch it. But one other thing that would help you out. What if you had really hurt somebody? And you didn't care you hurt them because you were lost. And now all of a sudden... They have moved states away from you. You don't even live close to you. And you're diagnosed with a terminal disease. And it's all happening so fast. Or what if you've had a car wreck? And you're taking your last breath. breath and you know that you're just going to die. And you ain't got time to call them up. And ask for forgiveness. Does this verse of scripture... Is he must have hell? I don't think it does because we didn't sin against them. We sinned against God. Amen? Yeah. And God knows your heart. And I've heard so many people in the holiness uh, movement tell me, if you want the Holy Ghost, you got to go back and make your past right. And I've even heard people paying the tie store back for a tie they stole. Man. And they go by that scripture where Zacchaeus told the Lord, I repay you everything that I've done wrong. But if you go back and read closely, Jesus said, today I'm coming to your house. Not after you've paid them all back. If you've got to go relit every calf and you've got to go cross every T and you've got to dot every I, Jesus could have stayed at home. Come on, bro. Pray. Are you getting this tonight? Yeah. Now, the attitude of restoring that, the attitude of asking forgiveness for that, the attitude of making that right, nothing wrong with that attitude. If you get a chance to apologize to somebody and you don't think it's going to stir up drama, what do you mean by that? That's how I thought I was quit, but I don't miss I am. I just keep digging myself in the hole. Just say, you, you are committed adultery one time before when you was lost with somebody else's husband or wife. Honey, you better make sure it's the Lord telling you to go back and tell their husband that you slept with their wife because you might meet Jesus quick. Are you following what I'm saying? Those, now I ain't saying you don't need to go back if God says you need to go back and do it, you make sure God tells you not, Brother Brandon, don't cut them out. Like, Brother Brandon, you told me. No, I ain't tell you nothing because I've had people to do this before. That's why I'm going ahead and preach it. I've had people to, I mean, stir up junk. Go to people's house and my Brother Brandon told me I need a Brother Brandon ain't told you nothing. Okay? You better make sure Jesus is telling you to go do some of this stuff. Because you're going to get hurt quick. But it's a good attitude to have. If, but, but, but I just wanted to mention that because if you're dying and you've done something other that comes to your conscience, ask God to forgive you and trust he's going to take care of you. Amen? If you have a chance to go back and apologize, go back and apologize. It's never going to hurt. What you going to do with that money in your pocket? What you going to do with that money in your pocket? All the chicken houses are fine, but if you don't share what God has put in your pocket, He's going to take it back. Amen. And you're going to go from $60 million to nothing overnight. How many know some of them people hit the billion dollars two years from them broke as a joke? I'm like, can I have a job? A job? As much money as you come into? 
You should never have to work because if they don't know how to manage one dollar, they have no clue how to handle sixty million dollars. Or if I had sixty million dollars, bless the Lord, I would never have to work. Mm -hmm. Half of them bankrupt today. I know several folk, millionaires at one point in time, had all the money they could have. Some of them shoot themselves. Because that sixty million dollars isn't to be compared with the millions of dollars of salvation that Jesus has forgave us of tonight. But in our closing tonight with our parable, the man that came to him because he was trying to pay the Lord back, he went and got somebody that owed him a third of a side of an income or a boat or whatever you said they stole. I'm just putting Billy in this to help Billy catch a hold of this and all of us to catch a hold of this. The Lord has just forgave you for all your sins and now I'm going to go find that person that stole from me and I'm going to catch him by their throat and I'm going to rip their throat out. Ain't that what he did? Ripped him by the throat, grabbed him by the throat and said, you owe me what you stole from me. And the man does the same thing that, how many like to go to heaven? How many like to go to hell? No air conditioners to get away from it. He begged him. He said, oh, Lord, I don't have it. Will you give me a few days? He squeezed him harder. And he said, give me what you owe me. And if you read on in the last part, the same Lord who forgave him the first time of the $60 million, he had all that money in his pocket, but he wasn't sharing it. He turned around and took that $60 million back. Throw him in hell. Yeah. Tormentors. Turn him over to the tormentors until he paid the debt. He ain't never going to pay that debt. He's still wishing today, I was out of this place. Right. Bow your heads with me.